first, I uh, would like to thank uh, all of you for these two last weeks, um, which have been very nice for me. Uh, you have been um, um, very active and interested, and I, and I felt like uh, in a real classroom uh, with you. Uh, thank you for your participation and your homework. Um, so we started from the very basics of topological spaces. And now, finally, I can introduce you to uh, persistent homology. This is, this is very exciting. And um, as you understood, I like to present persistent homology uh, from a homology inference point of view. So what have we done so far? Um, we have been given a data set X that is a finite uh, subset of some Euclidean space. And we were asked to um, infer, to estimate the homology groups of the underlying shape of X. And the strategy we used consisted in thickening our uh, point cloud X, selecting thickenings that have the um, homotopy type of the underlying shape, and then computing the homology of this thickening via the check complex or the risk complex. So we have seen that uh, under some uh, geometric conditions, uh, among these uh, thickenings, we can see circles, OK? So um, it starts here. At this point in the filtration, we have a thickening, which is homotopy equivalent to the underlying circle. And so all of these thickenings allow to compute the homology of the circle, OK? But what really uh, happens here is that we, we are not able to, to, to really tell when we arrived at, at this point, where we, we really have the underlying shape. And moreover, well, we have seen the problem of topological noise just before having our uh, underlying circle. There are some cycles, some uh, homological features that appears. So here, for instance, or even before here, you see these three points, these three walls, they create a cycle. And so th this would be a problem for us, OK? So re really, the, 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 the question that persistent homology answers is the following. How can I handle topological noise while estimating a homology? So this will be a, a, a big lesson today. First, uh, I will tell you about a property of homology that I kept secret uh, until today, which is called uh, functorality. And really, this property uh, will allow to, to, to talk about persistence modules. One of the main properties of persistence module uh, is their decomposition. And uh, at last, uh, we will talk about uh, algorithms. So what is, what is this uh, property I'm talking about? Um, so what we have seen is that homology groups are uh, vector spaces that are associated to any topological space X. You can see homology uh, chosen any integer i. The ith homology is something that takes a topological space and gives you a vector space over z over to z. Actually, it does more than that. We can also transform continuous maps between topological spaces into linear maps between uh, homology groups. Okay, This is a functor uh, property. So in this course, we uh, adopt a simplicial uh, 
point of view, right? We do not study homology at the topological spaces level, but at the simply sure complexes level. So what I will present today is uh, the functionality at simply sure level. If we have a map between simply sure complexes, I will show you that we can deduce a map between homology groups. But first, we have to wonder what, what is it, a, a map, actually, between simply sure complexes, right? There is an equivalent of continuous maps for simply sure complexes. And this is called simply sure maps. So I give you the definition here. Consider two simply sure complexes, K and L with a set of vertices VK and VL. A simply sure map between the simply sure complexes K and L will be a map between the vertex, uh, the vertex sets, right? That satisfy this condition. If I take the image, if I take any simplex of the first simply sure complex, its image has to be also a simplex of the second simply sure complex. Okay, so really uh, a simply sure map is a map between vertices, uh, but to sometimes we will write uh, f from k to l instead of vk to vl because it's easier to write. Okay. I give you a, a simple example here. Say k is this segment, a simply sure complex of dimension one, and l is this triangle, also a simply sure complex of dimension one. I do not take the inner triangle. And I consider this map, f, that maps 0 to 0 and 1 to 1. OK? This map is simply sure because if I take any simplex of the first simple sure complex, I have only simplex of dimension one. This is the segment, the edge. Its image is this edge, which is a simplex of the second simple sure complex, right? A counter example. If I take this triangle and these two edges, the identity map, 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and 2 to 2, is not simply sure. Because if you take the image of this edge, 1, 2, this is not a simplex of the second simply sure complex. OK? This map here is not a simply sure map between these two simply sure complexes. And I have a last example which will be very important to us. Say I have a, a subset of the Euclidean space and I consider two of its check complexes, right? So remember that the check complex is the nerve of union of balls centered around every point of my uh, point cloud. For instance, the first one here is the check complex for a radius equal to S here, and its nerve is the triangle without the inner two simplex. And if I take T uh, greater than S, I could have that. So here, the three balls intersect. So I have a two simplex in my simple visual complex, okay? And the inclusion, you map 1 to 1, uh, 0 to 0, and 2 to 2. This map is a simple sure map, OK? Um, really, this is because uh, um, um, if I have s lower than t, then check s is included in check t, OK? And the inclusion map always is a simple sure map between simple sure complexes. Okay. 
Nice. We have simulation maps. Now, let me show you something. I did not a simplicial map F between two simplicial complexes. And I will have a look at the chain uh, complexes of K and L. So remember that I pick an integer M, the nth check, uh, chain, the nth group of chains of K is the set of formal sums uh, of simplices of dimension D, okay? Where I take the coefficients in Z over to Z. This is the same for L. And thanks to my um, simplicial map, I can define a map between the chains of K to the chains of L. And this is very natural. I take any simplex. I will define it on, on, on the, on the, uh, only on the simplices. And you can extend it by linearity. If I take a simplex in the chains, I will map it to its image. So its image by the simplicial map is uh, also a simplex of L by definition of a simplicial map. I will map it to its image if f is injective on sigma, OK? If f is not injective on sigma, I will map it to 0. OK? So I defined a map on a basis of this vector space. I can extend it by linearity. And what I obtain is a map Fn from the whole vector spaces, vector space of chain to the other one. Okay. And we have this map Fn for every n. So for instance, between the zero chain, between the one chain, the two chains, and so on. We have an infinite collection of maps. And uh, I've, I, I've wrote this diagram here. Um, so remember that between each chain, uh, chain group of my simplicial complexes, I have boundary operators, right? And it turns out that we have a very nice relation between the boundary operators and the induced maps. This is written here. For every n, applying our map Fn and then applying the boundary operator is the same as applying the boundary operator and then applying our map F. So for instance, in, if I'm here in C1 of K, the group of one chains, I can follow F and then I can follow the boundary, right? This composition is this diagonal arrow. But I can also follow the boundary operator and then the map F. And this lemma says that these two paths lead to the same function. Okay? These two compositions give you the same functions. Um, Lucas asks if there is a relation between Fn and Fn minus uh, one. There is no special relation between them. Um, Fn, I define it here. So let me say that again. If F is any simplicial map, I can define maps between chains. And I have some other maps between chains, the boundary operators. And I say that um, the compositions are equal. And this is a, a, a very important property that is called uh, commutativity. So I said that following this path is the same as following this one. 
Okay. Um, in other words, we say that this diagram commutes. I will read that in the chat. The diagram commutes. Okay. Meaning that the path that I can uh, draw on this diagram, if they have the same base space and the same end space, then they will be the same. Okay. Uh, another drawing. <clears throat> if I follow this map and then this one and then this one, this is the same as this one and then these two ones. This is also the same as this one, then this one, then this one. Okay. Diagram. Up. Commutes. And well, we can prove that. This is really a matter of definition. Um, I will take a simplex uh, in some uh, chain group of my simplicial complex K. And I want to verify that the boundary of the image of the simplex is equal to the image of the boundary of the simplex. And if I use the definition of a boundary, I can write uh, two sums like that. So the first term is the sum over all faces of the image of sigma of coda motion one. And the second term is the sum of uh, all faces of sigma, and then I take their image. Um, and yeah, really, uh, this is easy to show. Uh, um, we just have to distinguish uh, three cases. If f is injective on sigma, then you can verify that you obtain the same, the same terms. If f is not injective, and moreover, if the, the cardinal of the image is strictly, low, strictly lower than the cardinal of sigma minus one, you can show that these two terms are zero. And if it is just the same cardinal minus one, you can uh, still show that the two terms are zero, but you have just to take care a little bit because here you would obtain uh, two terms that cancel. Okay. So we have this property, the diagram commutes, and we can deduce a lot of things thanks to, to that. For instance, we can show that the image of any cycle is a cycle, and we can show that the image of any boundary is also a boundary. I hope you remember what is a cycle and what is a boundary. A cycle is a chain whose boundary is zero. <coughs> and a boundary is a, a chain which can be written as the boundary of another chain of dimension plus one. So let us prove first that the image of a cycle is a cycle. So let's C denote a cycle of dimension N in K. <laughs> um, I will compute this uh, term. I want to show that the boundary of the image is zero, right? The boundary of the image is the image of the boundary. Okay, here I used this uh, lemma. But the boundary of C is zero. 
because we took a C in the cycles. So by definition, its boundary is zero. So here I have uh, the image of zero, but F is a linear map. And so the image of zero is zero, okay? This proves that Fn of C is a cycle. And, and we can do really the same for the boundaries. Take a boundary uh, of dimension n. So it means that it can be written as the boundary of a chain C prime of the n plus one chains of k. This is also by definition. Now, the image of C by Fn is the image by Fn of the boundary of C prime, because C is the boundary of C prime. And now I use this lemma again. This is equal to the boundary of the image of C prime. Okay, so this shows that the image of C is a boundary because it can be written as the boundary of the n plus one chain in R. Okay. <clears throat> so image of cycle is cycle. Image of boundary is a boundary. And now we can uh, do some algebra. Remember that the um, linear subspace of the boundaries, the boundaries are a linear subspace of the cycles, all right? We also have that F, I should say Fn here. Fn is a map that takes a cycle and gives you a cycle. So the, oh, there is a mistake here. F of the cycle is a subset of Zn of L. And F of the boundaries is a subset of Bn of L. Okay. But when we have uh, uh, such a map, a map that um, uh, send a subspace to another subspace. In algebra, we can use a, a, a result, a theorem, that allow to define a map between the quotient uh, spaces. Okay? I can define a map, F n star, between the quotient of the cycles by the boundaries of k, and this map goes into the quotient of the boundaries of the quotient of L, okay? But the quotient of the cycle by the boundaries is exactly the homology groups. This is how we defined them. So actually this map F and star is a map between homology groups, okay? So we define here a map between the homology groups of K and of L. Um, and, 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 and yeah, so we obtain something like that. Um, really, this map F and star is what you think it is. Uh, if you have a chain in the homology group, uh, a cycle like that can be written as a sum of simplices its image by uh, F star is simply the sum of the linear combination of the images of the simplices. What I did is just writing it formally before. Oh, and also um, an observation here. The boundary operators uh, allowed to, to link the chain uh, spaces, right? But when we are at the homology level, there are no uh, maps between these homology groups. Okay. All we have 
are these induced maps. Okay. I will give you some examples. Um, okay. This is the most simple example. I take K and L to be the same, the triangles here, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. And the map I will be uh, F before, I call it I here, will be the inclusion. I map 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2. This is a simplicial map. And I can consider uh, its induced map in homology. Okay. I 0, sorry. I zero star is a map uh, between the zeroth homology group of K and the zeroth homology group of L. These two groups are Z over to Z, remember, because we have one connected component. And this map actually is the identity map. Um, now what is uh, the induced map between H1 groups? The H1 of K is Z over to Z because I have one cycle that is not a boundary. Same for L. And uh, again, A1 star is the identity. You map the element one of Z over to Z to the element one of Z over to Z. So the identity map induces the identity between homology groups. Another example where the codomain here is a simplicial complex of dimension two, I still consider the identity map. Okay. This is a simplicial map because the first one is included in the second simplicial complex. Now, what is H1 of K? It's Z over to Z and H1 of L this is zero. The field triangle is like a point. It has no uh, homology in dimension greater than zero. So obviously, this map A1 star, without even uh, writing uh, formula, we can say that it is a zero map. OK? And, and yeah, so we can interpret this uh, uh, map here saying that the cycle of k is sent to zero, OK? And the idea is that if you, write, if you, if you draw your cycle here, you can retract it to a point. It is homotopic to a point. So this is uh, topologically uh, trivial, OK? Um, another example, I have the same simplicial complex K, but now L is these two, these two triangles. Uh, I have a question of Lucas. How to conclude that H1 of K is homomorphic to Z over to Z? Uh, here, I do not prove that. I, I just uh, use the result. But if you want to prove that its first homology group is z over to z, you can use the algorithm, for instance, incremental algorithm. Um, but yeah, just the idea, you can understand that by saying that you have a cycle that cannot be retracted to a point. So L is two triangles. I still consider the identity map, 0 to 0, 1 to 1, 2 to 2. Now, what is the first homology group of L? Uh, well, you can prove that it's z over to z squared. Its first Betty number is 2. Uh, this is because, well, you can apply the algorithm or uh, um, just understand that uh, there is two, two two cycles in this simplicial complex that are not uh, equal up to a boundary. Well, so 
A1 is a map between uh, a vector space of dimension one to a vector space of dimension two. And we just send this cycle to this cycle. So you send one zero, a one here to one zero. And any map between any linear map can be written as a matrix. So matrix here will be one zero. Oh, yes, some funny things may happen with uh, induced maps. For instance, if uh, this is an exercise for you, if um, I take this simplicial complex and I map it to the triangle modulo three, so zero is sent to zero, one to one, two to two, three to zero, four to one, and five to two. You can show that the induced map between uh, homology groups, first homology groups, is zero. This is uh, basically because you send the cycle to twice the cycle, twice itself. And as we are in z over 2z, twice something is zero. Well, recap. If I have the identity map, the induced map is also the identity. Sometimes I can fill my circle, in which case the induced map is zero. And if he, there is other cycles at the end, well, I, I'm just uh, the inclusion map. OK. So this is uh, functionality. We can transform maps between uh, in maps. I can transform a simplicial map into a linear map. And there is this property, uh, very important, that is called the functor property. It says the following. Take three simplicial complexes, K, L, and M, and consider two maps, two simplicial maps, F from K to L and G from L to M. Okay. This is this drawing here. I have this map, this map, and this map. Now I can uh, apply the ith homology. I obtain homology groups, right? And I also obtain uh, induced maps. Okay. F star is the induced map of F. G star is induced by G. And here, GF star is the induced map in homology by GF. Okay. And this uh, proposition here states that this map here is equal to the composition of F and G. Okay. The composition of induced maps is the map induced by the composition. Is equal to the map. So, in other words, this diagram commutes, right? If I follow this path, I end up with the same function then. The path. Okay. Um, and yeah, this is very nice. And well, um, the the proof is is again there is no very interesting idea in the proof. You just have to verify that your definition um, allow allows this property. Uh, you just have to take care that. Um, 
by composing simple C's, you do not uh, obtain zero. Uh, um, well, trust me, it's, it's easy to, to prove. Okay, so this is it for uh, functoriality. Do you have any question? Okay. Now, um, we'd like to show you how this uh, property of functoriality will help us in our uh, topological inference problem. So as usual, let's take a subset of the Euclidean space X and thicken it, okay? Um, you can write the thickenings like that. They are all included one in another. And then I can, I can take the, nerve, the nerves of these thickenings and I obtain check complexes and uh, this is again an increasing sequence of simplicial complexes. If T1 is lower than T2, check of T1 is lower than check of T2. Okay. Uh, these inclusions here, I will denote them I. Okay, I just want to give a name to the inclusion map. Uh, for instance, the inclusion map between T1, check T1 and check T2, I denote it, I, T1, T2, okay? And now I will put all of this on the homology side of the mirror. I apply the i homology functor, okay? So I have uh, homology groups. And thanks to the functorality property, these inclusion maps are also transformed into maps between vector spaces into linear maps, right? So I have a complex of vector spaces. And now I'm able to uh, uh, talk about topological noise. I can define persistence. So um, say, ch choose a cycle somewhere in, in, in your uh, complex. Um, a cycle, a, a topological feature of your uh, thickening. You can define its death time as the largest value of T such that its image is non-zero, okay? If I pick a, a cycle here, I can look at the image of the cycle between the larger thickenings. And I will define its death time as the largest value for which it is still non-zero, okay? And at some point, my cycle will become filled and this will be zero. I can also define its birth time. This is the smallest value uh, uh, such that there is ex exists an element in the uh, homology group of uh, at time t uh, that will give you your cycle. This is the smallest value such that my cycle admits a pre-image. So basically this is what is the first time my cycle appeared, okay? So if you choose a cycle somewhere in your filtration, you can define its birth and its death. And we say that the persistence of your cycle is the difference between these two uh, values, okay? Tiago, this is for all C or for a given C? This is for a, a given C. You choose any C, any cycle, and you can define its persistence. And the idea is that a cycle 
with large persistence will correspond to uh, an important feature of my data set, while a cycle with short persistence uh, would mean a topological noise. For instance, say I am here in H1, HI of uh, check T1, and I have this cycle here. And I wonder, is it a persisting cycle? I look at the higher values of filtration, and very quickly, this cycle will be sent to zero, right? Uh, there will be a homology group very soon where the induced map will be zero. So its date, death time uh, will be close to, to this value. And you can also see that its birth time is close. So at the end, the persistence of this cycle here, this hole is small. And this corresponds to the idea of topological noise. While for this large circle here, which is actually the homology of the underlying circle, we will have to wait for a long time before filling in the data set. Okay? So this cycle will have a large persistence. And yeah, really, uh, um, this is the idea of persistent homology, understanding which cycles have small persistence and which cycles have uh, uh, long persistence. And all of this is uh, summarized, is gathered into the notion of persistence module. So follow me. A persistence module, this is uh, a pair, V, V, big V and small V. Big V will be a collection of Z over 2Z Z over, yeah, Z over to the vector spaces. And small v will be a collection of linear maps between these vector spaces. And these linear maps have to satisfy two axioms. First, the map from uh, a vector space to itself must be the identity map. And if you have three values of t, rst, then the composition of vrs from vs to v, from vr to vs with vst must be equal to vrt. Okay, I should make a drawing here. I have vr. Vs, Vt, the first map here is Vrs, the second one is V. St. We have a third map here, VRT. And the property says that this diagram is commutative. Okay, The composition of these two maps is equal to simply this map. And so, as you will see soon, this is exactly the functorality property of the homology. OK, if I have such a sequence of vector spaces endowed with maps that satisfy this condition, I say that I have a, a persistence module. So how do we obtain these persistence modules in practice? Well, we already did that. We use filtrations. So I want to, to uh, define filtrations here. A filtration 
of E. E here, sorry, is uh, the Euclidean space, Rn. This is a family of subsets of the Euclidean space that is non-decreasing. Okay, This is an increasing sequence of subsets of the Euclidean space. We can also define filtrations for simplicial complexes. So filtration of simplicial complexes is simply a non-decreasing family of simplicial complexes. OK, so I have uh, something like that. Now, this, yeah, this is um, linked with the filtration in probability, but really, this is simply uh, an increasing family of, of subsets. I can write something like that, OK? Between my simplicial complexes, I have a diagram, and I uh, name the inclusion maps as before. And you've seen it. We apply the homology functor. OK, we obtain vector spaces and linear maps between these vector spaces. This is a persistence module. Okay. We should verify that these two axioms are satisfied. Uh, but this one is satisfied because the image in homology of the identity is the identity map between vector spaces. And why do we have this uh, commutativity? Well, this is a commutativity property, the functorality of homology. Okay. So in practice, we will obtain persistence modules uh, by building filtrations, such as check filtrations or ribs filtrations, and then in applying the homology functor. Okay. Please excuse me, I will come back in uh, two minutes. OK, so we defined persistence modules. Now, what can persistence modules tell us about our uh, data set? Um, we will have to do some algebra here. So first, I will introduce uh, two notions. Uh, first, I define here what is an uh, isomorphism of persistence module. Okay, This is really the same idea than uh, isomorphism of vector spaces. You just have to take care of the fact that you have several vector spaces. So consider two persistence modules, V and W. An isomorphism between them is um, a family 
of linear maps. Each linear map phi t goes from vt to wt. Okay. And I want that these maps are uh, isomorphisms of linear spaces. And that these diagrams commute for every s lower than t. Okay. Here uh, on the top, you have two linear spaces of the first persistence module, and you have the, the map VST between them. Okay. This is simply the data of the first persistence module. And you have your two uh, maps, phi s, phi t, that goes into your second persistence module. You want that this composition is equal to this composition. Okay. And when such an isomorphism uh, exists between two persistence modules, we say that it is, uh, they are isomorphic. OK. Now I define the sum of two persistence modules. Um, the sum of two persistence modules it is denoted like that, v plus w. So I have to define what are the vector spaces and what are the linear maps between these vector spaces. I define the vector spaces as simply the sum, uh, like, the, like the sum of two vector spaces. And I define the map as the sum of the initial maps, OK? So explicitly, uh, in this linear space, I take a point x, y. Its image will be, well, to x, I apply the map coming from v. And to y, I apply the map coming from w. Okay. So I can define a persistence module uh, that is a sum of two persistence modules. Okay. And last definition, I will say that a persistence module is indecomposable, okay, if each time I can write u isomorphic to v plus w, then one of them has to be zero. u is indecomposable if when I can write that u is isomorphic to the sum of two persistence modules, then one of them is zero. Or w is zero. OK? So you have to, to, to see indecomposable uh, persistence modules as the elementary blocks of the theory of persistence modules, right? These are the persistence modules that cannot be described by smaller persistence modules. And uh, actually, we know what are the persistence, the indecomposable persistence modules? And they are called interval modules. So again, a definition. Uh, okay, take an interval i. This will be an interval of the real line, the positive, positive real numbers. So the interval might be closed or half open or open. Anyway, um, I will define a persistence module based on this interval, B i. Okay. So I have to define vector spaces and linear maps. I will say that the vector spaces are the following. If t is in the interval, I take the vector space z over 2z. 
the one dimensional vector space over z over to z. And if t is not in the interval, I will take zero, the zero vector space. Okay. So you should uh, see your persistence module like that. You have the interval, e, i, okay. And above every point of the interval, you put z over to z. And when you are outside of the interval, you put zero. Okay, now I have to define the linear maps. Simply, the linear map VST between VS and VT is the identity if I am in the interval, if S and T are in the interval, and the, this is zero outside. Okay. If S or T is not in the interval, the map will be zero. Okay. So this is an interval module. And um, what you can show is that such a persistence module is indecomposable. Okay. So basically, this is because it is one dimensional. You cannot put two uh, non trivial vector spaces into one dimensional vector space, right? Okay. Uh, now that we have interval modules, we will sum them. And this is very nice to understand how persistence modules uh, sums, sum. You can have this mental picture. If you were to sum this interval module and this one, you will obtain this, okay? So above each point of R, you can read uh, what is your vector space. Here, this is z over to z squared, right? Because I, I have the sum of z over to z and z over to z. And here, but this is simply uh, z over to z because I have only one vector space. And now the linear maps can be written as simply the concatenation of the other linear maps. And there is a mistake again. Here, this should be the matrix uh, one zero. Okay. Mm. So we can sum a lot of them, right? Um, so the idea is that if we sum persistence uh, interval modules, we will be able to describe any uh, persistence module. Uh, in other words, I want to write, say I have a persistence module, I want to write it as a sum of interval modules. I want to do that because I understand very well the interval modules. Okay, I can read what is the dimension. I can read what is what is a linear map. So I say that a persistence module decomposes into interval modules. If I can find a set of intervals, a, a multiset of intervals, such that my persistence module is isomorphic to a sum of interval modules. Okay. And yeah, I precise uh, multi set because the same interval may uh, appear several times. Okay. So this is like a set with uh, multiplicity. And um, Fortunately, it turns out that our persistence modules are, oh, not yet. Wait, before I talk about that, I wrote a theorem here. It says that if I can decompose a persistence module into interval modules, 
then the set of intervals is unique. Okay. Um, and when uh, I can decompose my module, I will call this set, this multiset of intervals, its barcode. Okay. A barcode is simply a set of intervals um, that is associated to any persistence module that can be decomposed into uh, interval modules. Okay. The theorem here just says that when it exists, it is unique, and we can talk about it. Okay. So this is a barcode. Uh, there is also another uh, representation of it that people use sometimes in, uh, in persistent homology. It is a persistence diagram. So instead of representing the intervals one above the other uh, under the real line, you can convert any interval into a point in R2, right? From the interval AB, I uh, draw the uh, point AB of R2. So A is lower than B. So uh, all my points here will be above this diagonal here. So really, this is uh, as you prefer. Um, barcode or diagram, they represent the same uh, thing. Depending on the application, you may prefer one representation or the other. Well, this is uh, the barcode. Uh, a summary of my uh, persistence module. But does it exist? And well, there, ha there have been a, a lot of work uh, uh, around this question. Those persistence module decomposes, and we know that they do when they are pointwise finite dimensional, okay? which will be the case for us in practice. So. Uh, a persistence module is pointwise finite dimensional if each of its vector spaces are finite dimensional, right? And so we have this very nice theorem of uh, crowley bovey uh, six years ago. It says that if my persistence module is pointwise finite, finite dimensional, then it can be decomposed into interval modules, and uh, and that's it. So I can consider its barcode or its persistence diagram. Um, and actually, this is a result that was known uh, uh, ten years before, uh, but which has been proven in a simpler case by uh, Zomorodian and Carlson. Um, this is a case where the persistence module is finite dimensional and has only finitely many terms, finitely many vector spaces. So basically, um, this is not a persistence module on the real line, but simply a finite number of persist of uh, vector spaces. Okay. Um, and yeah, I can I can show you the proof because it's very nice. Um, so if my persistence module is finite, has finitely many terms, I can write all the vector spaces one by one, v1, v2, v3, up to vn. Okay. And I will do something uh, uh, funny. I will consider the product, the sum, if you prefer, this is the same thing, the sum of all these vector spaces. Okay. I take the n vector spaces and I take their, their sum. I call it uh, v, like that. Okay. Now I will define an action for those who know what is an action in mathematics. I will define an action of the space of polynomials on v. Okay. And, and uh, the action is uh, the following. I take so the space of polynomials with one uh, indeterminate with coefficients in z over 2z. 
this is an algebra generated by, by X. Um, and I just have to define what is the action of X on my elements of V. An element of V is an n-tuple of uh, vectors. And I say that the image, the action of X on this tuple is simply you translate each uh, vector. You follow, basically you follow each of these maps. Okay. Here A1, I will consider its image by V12. A2, I will consider its image by V23, etc. This defines another tuple of V. Okay. So I obtain um, a vector space endowed with an action of the space of polynomials. The space of polynomials is a principal ideal domain, right? So I can see V as a, a module. And moreover, it's finitely generated. And we have a well-known uh, result uh, that you usually learn in third uh, year, uh, um, which says that we, we, we basically we, we know what are the finitely generated uh, modules over principal ideal domains. And they can be decomposed into uh, elementary blocks. Okay. And it turns out that this decomposition gives you the barcode of your persistence module. Okay. This was just a, a, a bonus for people who know algebra already. Well, anyway, what is important is that in practice, our persistence module will be decomposable and we will be able to uh, consider their barcodes. And the barcode is all the information we need for our problem of topological inference. And can I? Ah. OK, I, I wanted to show you a video. Wait a second. So here, you can see upon cloud x, all right? I will consider uh, its check filtration, its thickening filtration. This gives me a persistence module, and I can uh, decompose this persistence module into intervals. And I obtain that, OK? I obtain this barcode. In red, you can see the decomposition of H0, the zeroth homology group. And in green, H1, OK? And in this uh, barcode, you can see a lot of things. Um, first, you can see, you can read the homology of my thickenings at each time, OK? If I stop the video somewhere, for instance here, I see that I have one red bar so my H1, uh, my H0 has dimension one. It means that I have one connected component. And yeah, I have only one com connected component here. My H1 only have one bar, two, meaning that uh, my first bit number is one. I have one cycle. And yeah, actually, I have one cycle, right? And, and this goes on uh, until some point where, well, you go above the, the green bar, meaning that you don't have any cycle in H1. 
this is where when you were thickening is simply a, a ball, a point. Okay. Um, and you have other uh, interesting stuff. Uh, all these little green bars here, they correspond to topological noise, right? They will correspond to cycles that will die very quickly. For instance, if I pause here, so I can see that I intersect two intervals, one and two. So there must be two cycles in my thickening. And what do I have? I have a cycle here, yeah, and another one here. And one of them is going to die very quick, and the other one will persist a bit more. Okay, and you can see that another cycle will appear soon, and certainly this will be this one. Okay. Here, I read that I have only two cycles. Um, and we have the same interpretation for H0. So let me get back here. At the beginning, uh, remember that I have many connected components because the points did not connect already. Meaning that I have a H0 of high dimension. And as you can see, at the beginning, I have many red bars. Okay, my H0 uh, has large dimension. And the more uh, I, I thicken my sets, the less red bars I have. Okay, this is because the points link together. So you could say that, well, I have only one very long red bar. This is um, the connected components that persist throughout the filtration, and a lot of uh, small little bars that will correspond to topological noise, connectedness noise, if you wish. And I have generated this now uh, on Python on Matplotlib. This is just uh, a lot of frames glued together. Okay, so really this is the idea I want you to, to keep in mind. Um, all of this uh, algebraic study of persistence modules uh, is a way to formally understand how the cycles evolve in our thickening. And thanks to this uh, nice structure of persistence modules, we are able to tell whether a cycle is persistent or not. And we are able to tell if uh, the topological feature I observe is uh, uh, interesting, it, it, um, uh, reflects some statistical meaningful uh, topology. Okay, so yeah, there is a whole uh, expertise of reading uh, barcodes. And when you, you are given something like that, well, if you give me a barcode like that, without seeing, seeing the, the, the pan cloud, I would say, well, this is a circle. There is a topological space underlying your data that seems to be of the same homology of the circle. Well, um, so we will finish this lesson with a word about algorithms. Uh, how can we compute? this uh, uh, barcode and actually we already did all the work last week. Yeah, as um, <clears throat> Lucas says, 
it is easier to see the circle with the barcode than with the Betty curve because um, say that you have this large persisting cycle, but with small noise in the barcode, it's clear what is noise and what is not. Noise is small bars, but in the Betty curve, you are not really able to tell what is uh, what has small persistence or not. And yeah, basically the Betty curve is the sum of um, the number of bars, right? If you have a barcode, you can build the Betty curve easily. Yeah. Okay. Algorithm. So what do we have? We have a check complex, right? A uh, non-decreasing sequence of simplicial complexes. We will do just as before, uh, as last week, we will order the simplices of our uh, simplicial complexes. Okay. Uh, say my simplicial complex uh, at last have, has uh, n simplices. I want to order them, sigma one to sigma n. Uh, and I will use this uh, function here, t. t sigma will be the time of apparition of my simplex in the filtration. Okay. Uh, do I have a picture somewhere? Yeah. For instance, here, you will have the points at first, and then the edges, and then the triangle. Okay, so this will give you a filtration of your simplicial complex. The only problem is that sometimes simplices will arrive at the same time. Okay, when they do, just choose any order on them. So at the end, you will obtain an order of the simplices such that uh, if sigma i is lower than uh, sigma uh, j, then the apparition, the apparition time of sigma i will be lower or equal to the apparition time of sigma j. Okay. So I have my increasing uh, check complex. I add simplices one by one. How do I compute the homology of, of, of this? I take the boundary matrix and I apply a Gauss reduction as we have seen already. So this is the same example uh, as last week. Um, my filtration could look like that. In the boundary matrix, I write the boundary of each simplex. simplex. For instance, sigma five here is an edge. Its boundary is the sum of the two endpoints, which are sigma one and sigma two. Okay. Here, sigma 10 is a triangle. Its boundary is three edges. Well, I apply ghost reduction and I end up with a matrix uh, where I have some uh, interesting values. Remember that we define this, this map delta here. Delta of J is the largest index such that my element is non zero. Okay. And when the column is zero, I say that delta is undefined. Well, what we have seen is that uh, when it is undefined, then it means that I have uh, a positive simplex. And when it is defined, it means that I have a negative simplex. We can go a bit further. I will consider persistence pairs. So uh, a persistent pair will be a pair of simplices. Okay. For any j, consider delta j, okay, and build the pair sigma delta j, sigma j. I call it a persistent pair. 
um, if there is no delta j, uh, I mean, if I have a simplex such that on its row there is only zeros, I will pair it with plus infinity. Okay. So for example, this one here, sigma one, there is only zeros. Oh, sorry. Um, there is no uh, circle values. There is no integer j such that on its row, I can see delta j. So sigma one is mapped with plus infinity. Sigma two here, I read this row and I can see a one up I pair it with sigma five, sigma three with sigma six, sigma four with sigma seven, sigma eight, okay, uh, there is no end values of columns, so I map it with plus infinity, and sigma nine with sigma 10, okay? These are my persistent pairs. So why do we do that? This is because from these persistence pairs, we can read the barcode of our persistence module. The barcodes of my filtration, of my persistence module, is simply the following set of intervals. The intervals, uh, time of apparition of sigma, time of apparition of two for all persistent pairs sigma two. And I remove the persistence pairs with uh, same apparition time because they are only artifacts of the algorithm. Okay, um, so you can you can uh, prove that. Maybe it's a, a lot for today, so I won't read the proof. But basically, um, well, you can prove that just by building a, a filter a, a basis of your simplicial complex of your homology groups at each time value, and um, really these persistence pairs tell you when does your basi basis change. When do you have to remove an element of the basis, or when do you have to add an element of the basis? So you can uh, finally compute barcodes of persistence modules um, simply by applying the persistent, the homology algorithm, the incremental uh, reduction, the ghost reduction, sorry, and at the end, reading the persistent pairs which gives you intervals. And that's it. So I will conclude. Um, I showed you today that in order to uh, understand how cycles evolve in the filtration, uh, a good strategy is to uh, um, consider the uh, induced map in homology the map induced by the inclusions, okay? All this information, we gathered it into persistence module and with some very nice algebra, we have been able to decompose persistence modules into uh, interval modules. This gives you barcodes. And at the end, when you have a barcode, you know everything about the evolution of the homology of your uh, data set, okay? And uh, also I show you that we can compute this barcode easily with the Gauss reduction algorithm. So thank you everyone.